everybody. I'm Dr. Tadapali, one of the PGY3s here in the psychiatry department. It is my utmost pleasure to introduce to you all my colleague, Dr. Stanley. Um, a little bit about Dr. Stanley. He has a very interesting background in business administration, as well as from ETSU, as well as going to medical school here and now being a part of our program here with us. And let me share, he's a very good colleague to work with. If you, wa you guys wouldn't mind putting your hands together, we can welcome Dr. Stanley on stage and get this grand round started. Better? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I do not have any disclosures, financial disclosures, unfortunately. That'd be nice if I did. Um, here's some of the objectives. I'll go over the objectives because the, honestly, the title of the presentation is a little misleading. It's a little bit more than just shared psychotic disorder, so let's go into the objectives. Uh, we are going to talk about kind of traditional shared psychotic disorder. Um, we're also going to talk about things called Martha Mitchell effect. Most of, most of you probably have never heard of that. Um, talk about gang stalking um, and how that's uh, associated with other delusional disorders such as Morgellons. Um, we're going to look at the one major published study about gang stalking. Um, look at historical examples that put the current gang stalking phenomenon in perspective such as the Zersetzung um, in East Germany, uh, Project MK Ultra, and the Heirloom. Uh, we're going to look at a case report of Foley et Trois and discuss forensic aspects of the case and look closer at the relationship between thought disorder, cults, and religion. So, shared psychotic disorder, uh, also known as shared delusional disorder, was first described in 1877 as Foley Adu. Uh, it's a rare disorder shared by two or more people with close emotional ties. Uh, cases involving three or more people are very uncommon. And it was referred to in DSM-4 as shared psychotic disorder and induced psychotic disorder in ICD-10, uh, but it's absent in DSM-5. Uh, depending on whether the delusions are shared among two, three, four, or more people, it's called folie à deux, folie à trois, and so on. Um, there's four main subtypes. Uh, subtype A is pretty much the most common. Um, and it's where a dominant person with delusions imposes his or her delusions on a younger, more submissive person. Uh, both the persons are usually intimately associated and the delusions of the recipient disappear after separation. Information regarding the incidence and prevalence of shared psychotic disorder is lacking as the literature is pretty much only case reports. Uh, the delusion the disorder is characterized by transfer of delusions from one person to another. Uh, about 95% of the cases arise between members of the same family, and over 70% are between husband and wife, mother and child, two sisters. Uh, among siblings, the disorder is most common in sisters than in brothers. Uh, almost all cases involve members of a single family. Some of the risk factors include female gender, intellectual disability, suggestibility, passivity, histrionic personality traits and suspiciousness in the secondary case. Uh, the individual who first has the delusion is called the index case. They're often chronically ill and typically the influential member of a close relationship uh, with the more suggestible person, this is called the secondary case, who subsequently develops the delusion. The primary case is often diagnosed with schizophrenia and displays episodes of paranoid delusions. It's been reported the secondary case is characteristically younger, less intelligent, more gullible, more passive, with lower self-esteem than the index case, although these findings haven't been uh, consistently replicated. Um, affected individuals frequently live together and usually have an enmeshed relationship that isolates them from others. Uh, the degree of impairment is usually less severe in the secondary cases than the index case, and that's what we'll see um, in the case report we go over. Most of the individuals with this disorder lack insight and do not seek treatment. Uh, without intervention, the course is usually chronic, 
because this disorder most commonly occurs in relationships that are long-standing and resistant to change. However, if the relationship with the primary case is interrupted, the delusional beliefs of the other individuals may di diminish or disappear. Uh, recent data gathered from an analysis of case reports shows that separation of the secondary case from the index case may not be sufficient for resolution of the delusion. More commonly, the re recovery of the secondary case follows separation from the index case and the administration of antipsychotic medications. It's important to clarify the difference between an overvalued idea versus a delusion. Um, an overvalued idea is defined as an unreasonable belief that is not firmly held or fixed, um, whereas a delusion is a firm and fixed psychotic belief uh, regarding the self or objects outside the self that is maintained despite evidence to the contrary. The current DSM states that a person cannot be diagnosed as being delusional if the belief in question is one ordinarily accepted by other members of the person's culture or subculture. So it's not clear at what point a belief considered to be delusional escapes the fully a do or twa category and becomes legitimate becomes the, because of the number of people holding it, such as maybe a religion. When a large number of people may come to believe obviously false and potentially distressing things based purely on hearsay, these beliefs are not considered to be clinical delusions by the psychiatric profession and are labeled instead as something else such as mass hysteria, such as Salem witch trials, or as we'll discuss a little bit later, a religion, a cult, or culturally bound syndrome. In sociology and psychology, mass hysteria is a phenomenon that transmits collective illusions of threats, whether real or imaginary, through a population and society as a result of rumors and fear. In medicine, the term is used to describe the spontaneous manifestation of the same or similar hysterical physical symptoms by more than one person. I think uh, the Salem witch trials are the best example of mass hysteria that most people have heard of. So, is there a clear difference between a shared psychotic disorder, mass hysteria, culturally accepted beliefs, a cult, or a religion? And to take it even further, are, are we always able to tell the difference between a delusion and something that's actually true? Because I think we've all had patients that tell us bizarre stories that are completely false, but I bet everyone can think of at least one case where a patient told them something uh, that they thought was just made up or a delusion, but when they looked into it further, it turned out to be true. So enter the Martha Mitchell effect. Um, the Martha Mitchell effect is the process by which a psychiatrist or psychologist or other mental health clinician uh, labels the patient's accurate perception of real events as delusional and misdiagnoses accordingly. Examples of such situations are pursuit by organized criminals, surveillance by law enforcement officers, infidelity by a spouse, physical issues. Psychotherapist Joseph Burke quoted that even paranoids have enemies while explaining that any patient can be misdiagnosed by clinicians, especially patients with a history of paranoid delusions. Psychologist Brendan Maurer named the effect after Martha B. Beale Mitchell. Uh, Mrs. Mitchell was the wife of John Mitchell, the Attorney General in the Nixon administration. When she alleged that the White House officials were engaged in illegal activities, her claims were attributed to mental illness and her being an alcoholic. Ultimately, however, the facts of the Watergate scandal vindicated her and garnered her the label the Cassandra of Watergate. Although it's been stated that many of her allegations remain unproven, such as her claim that she had been drugged and put under guard at one point in order to prevent her from contacting the news media, James McCord, a former CIA officer, admitted in 1975 that her story was true, as reported in the New York Times. More supporting evidence that Martha was telling the truth was published in a 2017 news article in Newsweek. And that's Martha, again. They thought she was crazy. So. so 
So I'm going to shift gears now a little bit um, and talk about something that could come as a modern case of mass shared psychotic disorder establishment. The theory goes never gave up on the ambitions of Project MK Ultra, the CIA's infamous program to control the mind in the 1950s and 60s. And we'll talk about that. Here, there are books everywhere on this stuff. If you get on Amazon and look, it's dozens and dozens and dozens. So I thought I would just put up a couple uh, books in regards to the gang stalking. Uh, here's one, has good reviews, 24 reviews. And here's this one. This is a good book. It compares the behavior to Nazi behavior. Um, down here, it talks about the torture of being exposed to um, low frequency sound waves, which that will come back up in the presentation here in a minute, too. This guy, five stars, um, read number two, beware speaking to the wrong kinds of authorities about your situation, cops, priests. Therapists and other doctors are rarely reliable sources of good or helpful advice. The politicians one's okay, but the rest of them, I don't know. So, anyway, this is a billboard, a real billboard uh, in Los Angeles that was taken out um, by people that believe they're being gang stalked. There's enough of these people where they end up going to a lot of uh, political bodies to try to get laws passed on their behalf. So. Okay. So common themes in the gang stalking community, strong distrust of mental health pro professionals, doctors. There's actually instructional videos out there that tell patients to not visit psychiatrists. Um, alienation from family and friends. Some view the family members as perpetrator perps or just duplicates. Um, they were replaced. Uh, they advise if your relatives tell you you're imagining things, they could be in on it too. Um, also, there's some quite affluent community members, such as San Antonio anesthesiologist John Hall, who's a leading proponent. You would think this was all homeless people living on the street that believe this stuff, but it's not. There's some really affluent people with, in high up positions that feel that they're being gang stalked. Um, Symptoms of depression, trauma, and adverse impact on social functioning, difficulty holding a job, homelessness, or other delusions, delusional disorder present, such as more gallons. This was taken from a site devoted to more gallons and ties it with gang stalking, telling those with more gallons or delusional parasitosis that they are targeted individuals who have been attacked by a biological weapon. It says Morgellons is much like Nazi experiments on humans. Uh, and let me tell you, this site has an explanation for every symptom that they come up with and how it's tied to gang stalking and how the government's targeting them. Uh, and this was apparently from a, a fiber taken from one of their things that they pull out of their skin. And you can see the word NASA on the fiber. So. More on Morgellons, uh, Mary Lateo, a mother who rejected the medical diagnosis of her son's delusional parasitosis, named the supposed disease in 2002. She revived it from a letter written by a physician in the mid-17th century. She and others involved in Morgellons Research Foundation successfully lobbied members of U.S. Congress and the CDC to investigate the condition in 2006. In June 2007, the CDC opened a website relating to more gallons called the CDC Study of an Unexplained Dermopathy. And by November 2007, the CDC opened an investigation in, into the condition. Kaiser Permanente was chosen to assist with investigation, which involved skin biopsies from affected people and characterization of foreign materials such as fibers or threads obtained from people to determine their potential source. In January 2012, the CDC released the results of the study. Their conclusions were that 59% of the subjects showed cognitive defects, or deficits, sorry. 50% had drugs in their systems. And you may want to know what drugs that was. Amphetamines, barbiturates, benzos, cannabinoids, cocaine, opioids. 78% uh, reported exposure to solvents, or potential skin irritants. 
No parasites or mycobacteria were detected in the samples collected from any patients. Most materials collected from the participant's skin were composed of cellulose, likely of cotton origin. So there have been several notable cases where members of the gang stalking community have resorted to violence and mass murder and retaliation that you've probably seen on the news and maybe just never realized that this was gang stalking related. Um, Aaron Alexis, Washington DC shipyard shootings um, that killed 12 people. The suspect was driven by delusions that he had been controlled by low frequency radio waves. Refer back to that uh, Amazon review and scratch the words in the torment on the barrel of the shotgun he used. The clues about Alexis's mental state and motivations come from inscriptions found on his shotgun and documents found on his electronic devices. In one document he wrote, an ultra low frequency attack is what I've been subject to for the last three months. And to be perfectly honest, that is what has driven me to do this. The Navy has legitimately used such technology the FBI said, but these radio waves also have been at the center of conspiracies about government mind control. Another example is the Myron May Florida State Library shootings in 2014. Myron May, a former prosecutor from New Mexico, quit his job in 2014. Uh, he recorded an hour-long testimonial about how gang stalking had ruined his life just prior to the shootings and blamed his actions on gang stalking and at one point asking God to look down on the targeted individuals. On November 20th, 2014, Mr. May walked into a library at the Florida State University, which I personally frequently, frequent, frequented in my undergrad years, um, where he had graduated in 2005 and shot three people, leaving one paralyzed. He dared the police to kill him and then fired in their direction before being fatally shot himself. There's only been one major published study about gang stalking, so I want to discuss the one study. Um, it's a 2015 article published in the Journal of Forensic Psychiatry and Psychology um, complaints called Complaints of Group Stalking or Gang Stalking, an exploratory study of their nature and impact on complainants, written by Lorraine Sh uh, Sheridan, who's a forensic psychologist, and David James, who's a forensic psychiatrist. Here's a list of the aims of the study, which I'm not going to read through all of those, we'll get through them. Responses to questionnaires were examined by two senior forensic psychiatrists who made the determination of whether there was a high likelihood the beliefs expressed were delusional. They used DSM-5 definition of what consisted a delusion. Agreement was present in 245 of the cases, or 95.7%. And in the 11 cases where there was a disagreement, where it was deemed too difficult to judge, a third clinician decided the allocation. So first, presence of delusional beliefs. Um, there's a highly significant difference in the proportion of the group stalked considered to be delusional when compared to the individually stalked. All 128 uh, or 100% groups stalked were considered delusional versus just 3.9% cases of individual stalked. All 128 group stalk cases fell into one or more of the three categories where the cases where the resources or elaborate organization required to carry them out made the alleged activities highly improbable. For example, more than a thousand people involved, traffic lights and manipulated always to go red upon approach, or the cases where the activities described were impossible for example, minds of family and friends being externally controlled and cases where the beliefs were not only impossible, but bizarre. Uh, for example, a docile family dog replaced by exact double with a foul temper. That's my favorite. So, effect on the victim's mental state. Um, the group stalked were significantly more likely than the individually stalked to complain of being very scared, of feeling that they were going mad, of feeling depressed, and of symptoms associated with depression, suicidal thoughts, weight change, sleep disturbance, weakness, tiredness. Uh, the group stock cases were significantly more likely to report increased distrust and increased aggressiveness towards others than in individually stalked cases. There's no significant differences concerning anxiety, panic attacks, anger, or suicide attempts. 
the group stock did, did not feel subjectively more paranoid. They were significantly more likely than individually stalked cases to, to think the stalking had changed their priorities in life, but less likely to believe that it had changed their personality. Effect on the victim's behavior, uh, the group stalked were signi significantly more likely than the individually stalked to score positively on all 14 parameters examined, all of these, fearful of going out, staying in more, performance at work being affected, having to change jobs, um, having to move homes, give up social activities, forced to see less of family friends, getting rid of their car, changing routines, carrying a weapon, um, relationships breaking up, all of these, they scored higher. Reactions to, uh, of others, the group stalked were significantly more likely than the individually stalked to endorse the following statements. Others said I was overreacting, being paranoid, didn't want to go to police for fear of being ignored. Family friends did not take me seriously. Police did not take me seriously. They were significantly less likely to report um, that the reported behaviors had been reported as a crime by the police. And other coping strategies, the group stalked were significantly more likely to report using prescription medication and to report receiving more medical treatment than the individually stalked um, there is no significant difference in the reported use of recreational drugs. So many gang stalking patients reference two main sources of past evidence of gang stalking being real. Uh, the first being Zersetzung. Excuse me if I pronounced that wrong. But. So Zersetzung is German for decomposition. Uh, it's a psychological warfare technique used by the Stasi, or the East German secret police, to repress political opponents in East Germany during the 1970s and 1980s. It served to combat alleged and actual dissidents through covert means using secret methods of abusive control and psychological manipulation to prevent anti-government activities. Use of Zersetzung is well documented due to Stasi files published with several thousand or up to 10,000 individuals estimated to have become victims, 5,000 of whom sustained irreversible damage. There's actually special pensions for restitution um, for some of the victims. The Stasi used Zersetzung essentially as a means of psychological oppression and persecution uh, findings of operational psychology were formulated into method at the Stasi's College of Law and applied to political opponents in an effort to undermine their self-confidence and self-esteem. Operations were designed to intimidate and destabilize them by subjecting them to repeated disappointment and to socially alienate them by interfering with and disrupting their relationships with others, uh, as in social undermining. The aim was to induce personal crises in the victims, leaving them too unnerved and psychologically distressed to have the time and energy for anti-government activism. That sounds a lot like gang stalking to me. Um, Project MKUltra, uh, which is the United States, is thought to have begun in the early 1950s, and for nearly 20 years, the CIA's programs would see countless unsuspecting Americans exposed to drugs, Hypnosis, sensory deprivation, abuse, and torture wasn't until the Church Committee Congressional hearings in 1975 that many of the CIA's activities from MKUltra would come to light. Unfortunately, we'll never know the full extent of the program after former CIA Director Richard Helms ordered the destruction of all the MKUltra documents in 1973. But what we do know is somewhat alarming. MKUltra called for numerous mind control experiments to be conducted on a variety of patients. The goal of MKUltra was to examine methods of controlling and influencing the mind, primarily for the extraction of information from resistant subjects during interrogation. There were nearly 100 additional experiments. The feasibility of a brainwashed Manchurian candidate, the testing of drugs to cause amnesia, paralysis, and the inability to perform physical activity. Over 44 different colleges and universities were used in Project MKUltra. In addition, numerous hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies were paid by the CIA front companies to conduct various experiments without raising suspicion. 
In total, over 80 separate research entities were paid through various CIA sub-programs to conduct the experiments, and most of the researchers had no idea why they were running the experiments or who they were even working for. Operations were so secretive, even the agents running the CIA front companies were alleged to have not known anything beyond their own operations. Although LSD was one of the main drugs used, it was not the only drug used. Many drugs were experimented with in various tests, including but not limited to heroin, morphine, MDMA, mescaline, sodium pentothal, alcohol, and marijuana. Doctors also experimented experimented with drug combinations. Uh, in one instance, injecting a patient with barbiturates in one arm and amphetamines in the other. Since most of the records were destroyed, we don't know the full scope of the program's collateral damage. Despite this, we can say with some confidence there are some known deaths associated with the project. Perhaps the most well-known death from the MKUltra program is that of Dr. Frank Olson an army scientist and one of the researchers for the CIA's biowarfare program. Accounts vary, but according to his family, he had become disenfranchised with the operations in the program and was looking for a way out. After a CIA retreat where all the agents were unknowingly given LSD, Dr. Olson suffered severe paranoia and a nervous breakdown. After an internal evaluation by an agency psychiatrist, it was recommended that Dr. Olson be placed in a mental institution for recovery. Unfortunately, Dr. Olson would never make it to the institution. During his evaluation in New York, Dr. Olson jumped to his death from his 10th floor hotel room window. To this day, many believe Dr. Olson was coerced out the window. Hypnosis was a large part of the program as well. Uh, the CIA recruited noted Scottish psychiatrist Donald Ewan C Cameron, who had been experimenting with uh, reprogramming the human psyche by erasing memories. Some of the experiments were inhumane and secretive enough to warrant the CIA moving Cameron's operations to Canada, away from U.S. jurisdiction in the media's eyes. His methods would involve putting patients into a drug-induced coma for several weeks while playing loops of repetitive noises or sounds. He would use electroshock therapy at 30 to 40 times normal power. He would use sensory deprivation, locking patients in a room with no stimulus for weeks at a time. There was significant collateral damage from these experiments. Uh, his patients would become incontinent, start to develop amnesia, and in the most extreme cases, forget who their parents were or even how to talk. Throughout his career, he insisted he had honorable intentions of researching methods to correct schizophrenia through reprogramming of the psyche. Unfortunately, we'll never know what Cameron observed or concluded from his experiments. He died while hiking in 1967 in the midst of Project MKUltra. For reasons unknown, Cameron's family is said to have destroyed all of his records. Going back even further into the 1800s, I want to discuss something called the heirloom uh, described by psychiatric patient James Tilly Matthews, which shows striking similarities to modern-day gang stalking. You can be the judge if it's a coincidence or not. In 1810, John Haslam, a London apothecary, published the first ever book-length descriptions of a mad person's delusions. Until this point, most medical case histories of what we now refer to as mental illness had amounted to a line or two at most, and were more often just a single word such as frenzied or melancholy, Haslam wrote about a patient named James Tilly Matthews who described a previously unimagined world of futuristic machines, magnetic spies, mass brainwashing, woven into a well-informed narrative of the high politics behind the Napoleonic Wars. Haslam titled his book Illustrations of Madness, and it was full of lessons for the profession of mad doctoring, later to be known as psychiatry. Although Haslam isn't well known in the world of psychiatry, his account of Matthew's inner world is still cited as the first fully described case of what we now call paranoid schizophrenia, and in particular of an influencing machine, uh, the belief or delusion that a covertly operated device is acting at a distance to control the subject's mind and body. For anybody who has since had messages beamed at them by the CIA or UFOs or satellites, James Tilly Matthews is patient zero. 
Matthews was originally a British uh, political activist and peace campaigner and spent time during the French Revolution meeting with French officials attempting to avoid a looming war between England and France. However, after the execution of King Louis XVI, he was arrested under the suspicion of being an English spy. After being released three years later and returning to England, he accused multiple of his superiors of treason, saying that they were work working with the Jacobins, who are the most radical, ruthless French revolutionary groups at the time, to prolong the war. After making his conspiracy theories public, he was arrested, judged to be of unsound mind, and sentenced to Bedlam Hospital, right here. At the center of Matthew's delusions was the heirloom, a mind control device, which was operated by a gang of undercover French revolutionaries who had forced Britain into a disastrous war with revolutionary France and were bent on maintaining hostilities between the two nations. The operation directed at Matthews was only part of the larger story. There were more heirlooms and their gangs concealed across London. And their unseen influence extended all the way up to the Prime Minister, William Pitt, whose mind was firmly under their control. Their agents lurked in the streets, theaters, coffee houses, where they tricked the unsuspecting into inhaling magnetic fluids. The object of their intrigues was to poison the minds of politicians on both sides of the channel and thereby keep Britain and revolutionary France locked into their ruinous war. The heirloom worked by weaving airs or gases into a warp of magnetic, magnetic fluid which was then directed at its victim. Matthews made highly sophisticated blueprints of the machine so precise and finely rendered that his drawings would not have looked out of place in scientific journals or encyclopedias at the time. It was the first ever work published by an asylum inmate. A replica of the heirloom that he created was uh, later reproduced by artist Rob Dickinson and was most recently displayed um, at the Bethlehem Museum of the Mind in London. Okay, at this point I'm going to backtrack a bit, change directions, and uh, go over a case report of the more traditional shared psychotic disorder um, and kind of tie this together. Um, and it integrates some potential legal forensic elements and also discusses possible confusion between shared delusions versus cults versus religion. This is a case of uh, folie et toi that occurred in early 2000s in South Carolina. So here we go. Sister one was the index case, youngest of three sisters, 21 years old, previous, difficu previous difficulties with insomnia, high school educated with some college, not married, no children, employed at a local food, food processing plant. Sister two was 23 years old, a college graduate with a degree in early childhood education, worked as a fourth grade teacher, no past psych history. She's unmarried, had no children. Sister three, 22 years old, dropped out of college after four years due to depression, did not receive treatment. She was married with three young children, was unemployed. So, 18 months prior to the incident, Sister three became fearful of harm coming to her children at the hands of the grandmother due to grandmother's unspecified mental illness. Six months later, sister one and two moved in to assist with child care. Over the next several months, the sisters became inseparable. They were increasingly preoccupied with religion and spent hours praying together. They became isolated from everyone, including their own family members. Three days prior to the incident, the sisters became pr began praying continuously without sleeping. Sister one became convinced that God had special plans for her and her sisters and would provide for them, concluded the Bible had been tampered with and was now incorrect due to alternate spellings of Emmanuel and Emmanuel, was convinced God was trying to tell her something and convinced her sisters of the same. The day of the incident, the sisters disrobed in their home to free themselves from the confines of clothing. Sister one believed God wanted her to have the house that she and her sisters were later accused of burglarizing. She felt God was going to provide for her needs in this house similar to how God told Moses to claim the promised land. 
the three sisters drove to the house with the children, knocked on the door, and tried to force their way into the home. They broke windows, entered the home, disregarding and approaching police officers' orders. Sister one entered the home, assaulted the occupants before being restrained by off-duty officer who, was, who had arrived on the scene. Sisters two and three attacked the approaching officer while screaming, kill him, made references to God, Satan, and Judgment Day. So prior to the trial, trial, arrested and charged of burglary, assault, and battery with intent to kill and resisting arrest, they were placed in the same jail cell. They chanted, sang, sat in a circle, and invoked the name of God while nude in the cell. When approached, they bit, clawed, and kicked officers. They, they were sprayed with mace with little effect. Fifteen sheriff's deputies and officers required two hours to subdue the sisters. Each received additional legal charges for assault and battery. Sister one was hospitalized involuntarily and diagnosed with schizophrenia. Flufenazine was prescribed, to which she showed a favorable response. Uh, a court-appointed psychiatrist stated her delusion prevented her from recognizing the moral wrongfulness of her actions, and there was no opposing experts. The court concurred, and she was adjudicated not guilty of all charges by reason of insanity. She was committed to Department of Mental Health, then later discharged to a community residential treatment facility with court-ordered outpatient follow-up. The judge pro prohibited her from contacting the house occupants or her two sisters. Sisters two and three were involuntarily hospitalized and separated from each other and sister one. Their delusions resolved without antipsychotic medication. Similarly, they were adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity due to lack of knowledge of moral wrongfulness. After inpatient commitment to Department of Mental Health, they were discharged to outpatient care under the provision they were not to reside together or near the victims. At the time of the, the 2006 report, all three sisters were living in separate counties as ordered by the court. So some discussion about this case. An argument could be made that the three sisters had formed their own cult. Sister one could be thought of as the leader who believed that God had granted them a new home. The other two sisters could be said to resemble the members of a cult who adopted Sister one's belief system. If the two secondary cases have been considered members of a cult, rather than the individuals suffering from a shared psychotic disorder, they may have been found ineligible for the insanity, insanity de defense at the time of their actions because they would have not have evidence of diagnosable mental illness. And would that change anyone's mind if there was a fourth party? Make, make the fourth party a male. What about a fifth party? What would that change? I don't know. On occasion, a cult may resemble a case of mass shared psychotic disorder. The cult leader may be similar to an index case with beliefs not based in reality and the cult members may resemble secondary cases who adopt those beliefs. This gives rise to several debatable questions. One, when are the teachings of a few considered part of mainstream beliefs? Two, when should false beliefs be considered part of a delusional disorder rather than a cult system? And three, is there a minimum number of people who must share the beliefs for those beliefs to be considered cultish rather than delusional or even take it up to religion? May cult members, in some cases, be said to share a psychotic disorder? I don't know the answers to these questions. That's what I'm asking. To talk about cults a little bit more, um, in modern usage, uh, a cult describes an unconventional religious group that may be viewed by the larger society as strange or dangerous. Cults have been at times considered subsets of larger movements referred to as charismatic groups, which include organizations such as self-help groups, uh, radical, political, or social movements. Cults are characterized by the following. Uh, spiritual or religious preoccupation that breaks with accepted religious traditions that is imposed on its members. Uh, these beliefs cannot be proved or disproved. Uh, two, a high level of group cohesion that may prevent members from exercising freedom of choice to leave the group. 
a profound influence on the member's behavior, possibly inducing psych psychiatric symptoms. And lastly, leaders who are charismatic are considered special for divine reasons and are sometimes ruthless in their quest for financial, sexual, or power gains. So a few examples of some cults um, that many of you may remember. Heaven's Gate, um, March 26, 97, police discover the bodies of 39 members of the group in a house in the suburb of Rancho Santa Fe. They apparently had participated in a mass suicide in order to reach what they believed to be was an extraterrestrial spacecraft following the comet Haley Bop. Um, on that same date, uh, or a few days before that, Marshall Applewhite, who was their leader, taped himself speaking of mass suicide and asserted it was the only way to evacuate this Earth um, after claiming that a spacecraft was trailing Comet Haley Bob. Applewhite persuaded 38 followers to commit suicide so that their souls could board the su supposed craft. Applewhite believed that after their deaths, an, a UFO would take their souls to another level of existence above human which he described as being both physical and spiritual. This and other UFO-related beliefs held by the group have led some observers to characterize the group as a type of UFO religion versus a cult. In October 96, the group purchased alien abduction insurance. I looked that up, that is a real thing. That would cover up to 50 members and would pay out $1 million per person. The policy covered abduction, impregnation, and death by aliens. That is real. So, is that a shared delusional disorder, a cult, UFO religion? Your guess is as good as mine. That's a picture from the event where they all wore matching uniforms with Nike shoes and committed suicide in this big mansion. Scientology, religion or cult? I'm going to leave it at that. Um, Warren Jeffs and the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. He, uh, Warren Jeffs is still considered by many the current leader of the organization. He's also serving a life sentence plus 20 years for multiple felonies, including child sexual assault, rape, sexual assault, incest, sexual conduct with minors. He also arranged multiple legal marriages between his adult male followers and underage girls in Utah. He was at one point on the FBI's 10 most wanted list for these charges after he went into hiding from authorities. He has 87 wives and thought to have over 60 children. Since his arrest, there have been multiple people from his community speak out against his religion or cult and do several documentaries made about what is considered to be, by many, a polygamous cult. That's him during his trial. So the term drinking the Kool-Aid uh, originated from the Jonestown Massacre of 19 1978. The cult was uh, the People's Temple of the Disciples of Christ, a.k.a. People's Temple, uh, the leader, Jim Jones, had moved his followers to a compound in the South American country, Guiana, which prompted a U.S. congressman, Leo Ryan, to go investigate after there were claims that members of the organization were trying to leave but, but were being held there against their will. As the congressman was leaving with some of the defectors in the plane, members of the cult shot at the planes, killing the congressman and three members of the press. This prompted cult leader Jim Jones to give orders of the ensuing mass suicide where members drank Kool-Aid spiked with cyanide, Valium, Finnergan, and chloral hydrate. Over 900 people died from this, including 300, um, 17 years and under, including many, many infants and small children. Um, the events of Jonestown constituted the greatest single loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act uh, until 9-11. So there is a 2011 article in the Journal of Transcultural Psychiatry titled Religion and Psychosis, a Common Evolutionary Trajectory that I read that proposed some interesting ideas that I thought were kind of relevant to the dis discussion. Um, several suggestions have proposed over the years to explain why schizophrenia persists over the years with its low, lower fertility. Why hasn't it disappeared through natural selection? 
the authors of the article propose there's a continuum between everyday cognition, religion, and schizophrenia. Uh, and, and in this discussion, they propose that religion and schizophrenia may share mental modules. Um, human agency is our sense of control of an action or experience. And theory of the mind is our ability to attribute agency and cognition and intention to others. They propose that uh, religious cognition involves normal functioning, over-detection of agency, and over-extension of theory of the mind, but that schizophrenia involves impaired and abnormal functioning, over-detection of agency, and over-extension of theory of the mind. There is some evidence that schizophrenia is a ph phenomenon primarily of misattribution of agency. Patients with schizophrenia often report the immediate experience of someone else controlling their thoughts and actions. Alternatively, they may feel that they are in control of external events or convinced they know what other people think. Things or events are related to them in a special way or have a personal significance. Uh, symptoms which suggest mis misattribution of agency include thought insertion and withdrawal experiences, passivity, and certain auditory hallucinations. Key point here is that there is a loss of self-other boundaries. In certain religious traditions, telepathy and hypnosis are pervasive. Um, there's a God who knows their inner thoughts. Individuals can be punished, feel guilty or ashamed of these inner thoughts, even if they're not verbalized. For example, someone feeling uh, they would be punished because they had impure thoughts and felt God could hear these thoughts. Uh, yet with religion, there's a preservation of self-other boundaries versus schizophrenia, where there is a a complete loss of self other boundaries. Um, I included the history of the hearing voices data from the study, uh, a study just to show that there might be, as the authors suggest, maybe there is a continuum um, between normal everyday cognition, religion, and some sort of thought disorder. So, closing thoughts. Could you sort all these out? Is it really clear what the difference between a cult, a religion is, a uh, delusion, the truth, uh, conspiracy theorist versus a delusion? I don't think so. I didn't really find a real clear boundary between these, and that's why I'm presenting. So, um, also, yeah, delusion versus truth. What about the Martha Mitchell effect? Everybody thought she was crazy uh, went with the Watergate scandal and blamed her for being an alcoholic and having mental issues uh, when she said that there was funny stuff going on with the Nixon administration. And then she turned out to be true. So can we always tell the difference? Do we sometimes rush to judgment too quickly with patients that tell kind of bizarre stories? Uh, what can we do as providers with the increasing number of patients reporting gang stalking and its association, association with more gallons, considering providers are often avoided, not trusted, and the internet continues to propagate these delusions? I've been on the internet a lot looking at this stuff just to see what like, my patients are looking at, and let me tell you, it's crazy stuff. And it, it makes sense why they would come in with one delusion and come back the next time with three delusions because it just feeds in, these websites feed into one another. I've been down that rabbit hole the past couple months, so. Yeah. That is my citation. I'll leave that up just for a few seconds. And, and questions. Examples you mentioned was like, young girls less than 10 years old that were given, I think, LSD or something for mind control, one of the ones that you mentioned. Um, do you know why young girls particularly as opposed to? I don't know whether, all I know is that those pictures are associated like with that experiment and that's where those pictures were, like the file was from those experiments. Whether they were the ones giving LSD, gi giving LSD I don't know or not. But I know that, I mean, Lots and lots of people were. A lot of the records have been destroyed. We just know that it happened. We don't know like the details of like who, who got it and who didn't. It. I'm just curious if at that time frame there was this perception that, there, that 
young girls would be the most vulnerable to this effect or not? I'm just wondering. That's something to look into, yeah. Any other questions for our speaker? Thank you, Dr. Stanley, for the fascinating presentation.